Good afternoon, Deborah. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for welcoming me to your office uh, here <laughs> in University of yes. East London campus. My um, we know each other because we go to the same church for a couple of years now. True. Um, and so this will be a conversation exploring your life and times here in East London, a little bit of your work and some of your perspectives on mm -hmm. how your work uh, correlates with East London and maybe London at large. Okay. But it'll be, uh, maybe just introduce yourself and, and we'll go from sure. there. So my name is Deborah Benros. I'm an architect, uh, currently lecturing architecture in University of East London. And I've been living in London for the last 15, 16 years. 15, yeah. 16 years. Yeah. Amazing. And where were you before that? If you could just go, your, so your journey coming into London, <laughs> yes. but not too far back. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm Portuguese originally, uh, and I did my undergrad in Portugal. Uh, but back in 2006, I accepted a position here in a, an architectural practice, which I was very excited about, uh, very excited to join. Uh, and then since then, uh, has been a back and forth between uh, academic experience during my PhD, but then going back to practice and then going back to, ac to, to, to academia. I had a little stint in the US teaching there for a semester and then I returned and I went back to practice again. And then um, just a year ago, I managed to join academia for good. So it's it's a full time position now, and I'm super happy. For good, and and you might go back into practice, or or you're I, not sure. It depends I on the future. I think if I ever go back to practice, it will be for my own uh, practice. So to actually have my own office. Cool. Uh, I don't think I would ever want to work for anyone else again. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And for those who aren't familiar with architecture and its yeah. various disciplines, could you just explain? your area of expertise etc yeah that's 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 a cool question actually uh so mostly the work i've done in practice was in big firms and doing very big commercial projects so anything ranging from airports to large office buildings and when i say large office buildings offices that uh, host ten thousand people uh and some some retail projects as well some large retail projects uh, Apple stores, that, that sort of uh, thing. So big scale projects. Uh, so it's very unlikely that if I ever open my office, uh, I will start by doing things of that scale. Um, and in my teaching and in my academic career, I was always focused on residential projects, funny enough. So I see myself most likely to actually, if I do open something in the future, would be in, in residential. And, and, and that's building right because that's because 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 when you mention large office mm -hmm. space i was thinking the inevitable with a pandemic and more hybrid remote working Oof, now yeah. i know in big cities like like new york for example yeah. they're looking at retrofitting mm -hmm. those spaces for you know part commercial use part residential use Interesting, so yeah. it is is yeah is your area the building or retrofitting if that's the description or most of my work uh, in practice was with new buildings so new build uh, very little refurbishment. Uh, we did do a, f a few refurbishment projects, uh, but it was basically you leave the facade and everything else goes. So you can't really say that is a proper retrofit or mm, a proper mm. very conservative kind of approach to it. It was pretty much, okay, there's a listed facade or if there's uh, a listed component of the building, you keep that and then you do something completely new from the inside. And most of those big large-scale projects that I've worked, airports and offices, buildings. They were pre-pandemic, so they were really big infrastructure for a lot of people to actually work in the same space. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see what people are going to design the next 10 years, because obviously there's a massive shift into doing something that could be a little bit more flexible so people can work from home. Even though I think a lot of people thought that with the pandemic it would be far more flexible and we're we're noticing a big trend of people actually returning to the office and not working from home anymore mm. uh, and you see that in the university there's no more remote teaching for instance you see that in some architectural practices there are like a hundred percent in the office and, and actually yeah, so so that remote teaching how how was it for you as a lecturer like do you mm -hmm. like it or do you prefer to your students being in so when I joined UEL was during the pandemic. So the first the first academic year was mostly remote. Well, uh, lectures were remote and then uh, we had one-on-one -on -one tutorials. That, that's pretty much how it worked. And I have to say, when you are teaching remotely, 
there is a massive thing that misses, which is the students' interaction and how they engage and seeing their faces and seeing if they're following what you're trying to, to teach them or not. And that's that's a massive uh, issue when you're when you're remote. Obviously, you can see small small little thumbnail images of them, but it's it's really not the same. They can be distracted. They can have the camera off. It's it's not the same. You don't get the same engagement for sure. Yeah. Uh, on a personal and very sort of egotistic kind of way, I quite like the fact that sometimes you can work remotely and you can be at home and you can do the everything that you do in the office as well at home. It's very comfortable. Uh, is it the best? Not sure. <laughs> cool. Another interesting like thing to understand the trends, right? You know, the, the increasing conversation about sustainability yeah. has that entered into your work as as well, or yes, or you, was that always there? I see, maybe. Yes, no. <laughs> when you work in really big practices, even if they are committed with sustainability, sometimes cost is an issue, and sustainability obviously comes with an add-in cost. Uh, sometimes the clients are not that engage with the fact that yes you can do a building that is slightly more sustainable but it's going to cost you more other clients are very it's part of their agenda and some of the clients that i've worked with i've worked with apple for instance and it was part of their agenda to build uh, offices that were very uh, enjoyable for people to work on with natural ventilation with natural daylight with a low consumption of energy uh, so a lot of uh, sustainable energy sources and a lot of uh, interesting methods of making the building a little bit more efficient and less polluting for instance even during construction so that was always in there but when i joined uel um, UEL has a very big conscience in terms of sustainability and not only sort of sustainability in terms of the environment but also social sustainability involving communities, involving making, making buildings that people actually enjoy and, pe and, and sort of conserve the community. Uh, so I have to say I was exposed to a, a, a brand new world of, of, of sustainability and principles of sustainability. Uh, and a lot of work that the students are doing here is actually researching new materials and we have interesting protocols with industry that have byproducts of things that they manufacture, for instance, Tate and uh, they they work well. They do, do they produce sugar, so they use, use sugar canes just so over what, the river. Woolwich. Just over the yeah, river. Yeah, yeah. So what do you do with all those fibers that are sort of uh, pressed and the sugar is extracted? And what do you do with that? So we are we have lots of protocols f with them, and we're producing actually building materials with those fibers. So there's there's a really interesting uh, initiative here in the university of not only making buildings that are more sustainable, but also using uh, products that are have. Uh, a less impact on the on locally the sourced. And I'm, I'm really sourced. paranoid about my recording, so I just want to check. Okay. It's... Go for it. Yeah, we're all good. good. All right, cool. Good, good, good. Um, yeah, uh, if, if 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 I could pick up on that, mm. um, so so the protocol I assume is a you know isn't a, a mandated one. It's one that has organically come in relationship with Tate and yeah. Lyle, the company. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, as, as, as you may know, I'm a civil servant, so I can't be too um, political yes. or, you know, critical of government. In, in, in your mind, though, do, do you think that's the right balance right now to, you know, expect industry to voluntarily strike up these environmental partnerships? Or do you think there should be a little bit more of a mandate and law set in from government that, you oh, know... I, I wouldn't go that far, but um, I, I think that would help, obviously, uh, some sort of imposition or some sort of... Uh, uh, mandatory commitment to actually assist but I well we're doing what we can as a university and it's nice to have these industrial partners that actually are interested to know as well what they can do with the byproduct of of what they produce uh, in order not to reduce pollution but also find a product that is sustainable and is easy to apply and it's actually quite has a good performance as well in the building construction industry and as you know construction industry is one of the most pollutants is one of the the least sustainables just using i don't know a lot of concrete and steel which is the the backbone of, of our constructed construction industry is extremely it has very very big impacts in, in 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 the environment and in the carbon footprint for instance uh, so we are here actually trying to teach our students about alternative methods of constructing. What do you do when you don't have concrete or, or steel? What kind of other materials are available and what kind of other materials are actually affordable, perform well and actually are good for the environment and still 
are stable and um, perform well in, in, in a case of a fire, an occurrence of a fire, for instance. So, yeah, we're very interested. Or, or earthquake, as we timely oh, see yes. in true. Turkey and Syria, unfortunately. True, true, true. A lot of factors to try and balance mm. and get right. Um, and then I imagine the, you know, financial economics is also a, an issue that, yeah, concrete, I think, is quite cheap and can, yes. you know, get it easily. And building, yeah, isn't, isn't cheap. So a lot of things to, to consider exactly. and balance. Exactly. Yeah. And concrete has many, many, many good things about it. It's, it's as you said, it's affordable. It's very strong. It's very flexible. You can get great buildings with very little support. Uh, it's very stable in fire. It's very stable in earthquakes. So there's lots of advantages, but how can we mitigate the bad impacts, use it still, but maybe reduce a little bit the percentage of cement that we use in it or the percentage of steel that we use in it. Mm. So there's there's lots of things that we can do. And it starts with small steps. I, I, I'm not one of those, ra- I'm definitely not a radical that says we cannot use this material anymore, but how can we make it a little bit better? And um, in, in, in the discipline of architecture, etc., are there quite radical groups and people <laughs> oh, who yes. are like, They're... no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that like? I've, yeah, I've got no idea. I'll be interested to... Well, I, I, I'm always concerned about calling people radicals because, I don't know, maybe I'm too soft. And maybe... From your perspective. Yeah. Exactly. I, I think change is required. Um, but sometimes, yes, I think, I think with certain aspects, we can actually take big steps and achieve greatness with without causing a lot of uh, uh, bad impacts and sometimes I think small steps are actually quite beneficial because it allows us to sort of adjust and to assess if, if we're doing actually has other impacts that we didn't uh, account for so yeah I'm, I'm, I'm a very tolerant middle ground kind of person so yeah um, uh, another personal question and again if, if you don't feel comfortable you don't have mm-hmm. to answer but um so, so, so thinking now on the more individual residential parts of that yes. sustainability environment, you know, are you, you're familiar with the movement Insulate Britain? Yes. And, you know, quite aggressive action to get it on the political agenda yeah. about insulating homes, etc. Um, yeah, interesting to get your, your perspectives on that and, I suppose, um, you know, the ownership individuals should take to try and, not only for cheaper bills, mm-hmm. but I suppose, yeah, environmental impacts... Do you think people should be making more aggressive action on that? Um, I'm totally or... against violence and I'm oh. totally against radical movements that, I don't know, block roads and, I don't know, go into museums and throw things into into pieces of art. And I, I don't think change should be done that way. I, I, think, I think sometimes people have to be a little bit radical to actually uh, create a bit of a movement and create a bit of emotion as well. I understand that. Uh, I condone some of, of the acts that some of these movements do, even though they come from a, an excellent kind of uh, background and they, they, they know what they're uh, preaching and they, they, it, it makes perfect sense. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about how they sort of come about. Yeah, but sorry, I'm, I'm, I mean, like maybe to focus on the, on the engineering, for one of the better words, yeah. side of it, yeah. in terms of is that the best action people can take for residential In terms of residential homes. homes. Yeah. Yes, there's there's lots of, of issues, especially if you look at Victorian houses or some of the, the mid-century uh, console blocks as well. They're poorly insulated. The, some of them still have single glazing. They have pretty, pretty weak uh, window frames in UPVC or other materials. And yes, if, if you have a house that's poorly insulated, no matter how much you heat it, you, you're always going to need more heating and you're always going to feel uncomfortable. So to have an insulated home, it actually helps a lot uh, and it would be quite a good measurement. But then obviously we look at what happened in, and I don't want to move away from the the, 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 the theme, but for instance, Grenfell was uh, one of those council blocks that was poorly insulated mm-hmm. and they did an intervention to actually mm-hmm. insulate it and make it a little bit more uh, thermal, performing thermally much better. So they changed to double glazing and they created these uh, insulation panels uh, that were clad with with metal on the outside. Unfortunately, it was poorly installed. Unfortunately, uh, the the insulation material was was very combustible and 
when the fire broke, it just sort of light up like a, a match. So mm. it was terrible. However, the building was performing slightly better than it was before in terms of uh, thermal performance. And that was the, the whole goal. But then, yeah, other aspects were sort of overlooked or underlooked. There's a big challenge, isn't there? Because, um, yeah, on, on that council estate perspective there, there are issues there. There are also yes. issues with, with mould and the condensation. Yes. And I think there was a... Uh, a young boy who unfortunately died um, because of the, yes. the poor housing condition. And yeah, across parts of East London where we live, oh, I know that's also an issue. It's an issue um, in my house. <laughs> I, yes. it, it, it's, a, it, it's an issue in my house as well. My daughter has asthma. Um, yeah. And so, you know, yeah, yeah. the condensation of the mould isn't, isn't great. My wife also. Um, where do we begin in terms of solutions? Yeah. And um, yeah... I, I, I don't know. Well, the reasons for condensation are a thousand and, and a little bit more. So the, it could be so many things. could be the house is poorly insulated. It could be a lack of ventilation. could be some sort of faulty part in the building that is sort of leaking in and allowing water to come in. Or it could be just the difference of temperatures between the outside and the inside. And again, poorly insulated. So there's the inside water from... from a bath and shower and cooking sort of finds a cold surface and just condensates. It just there, yeah. So it could be a myriad of, of reasons. And I think that the, the biggest issue is that the construction industry uh, and anything that you want to do in, in terms of construction is always quite costly. Uh, so people in, in sort of the, the lower uh, parts of society that don't have access to uh, great funds can never sort of improve their houses which is a massive issue. Uh, and you see these people really struggling because they have lots of condensation. Condensation leads into mold and mold is com completely linked into, into um, health, health yeah. issues, especially respiratory uh, diseases. And in my house specifically, we, we know what is the issue. We believe that there's a, a capping on the party wall that probably is uh, either gone or faulty and there's probably some water penetrating there and then regularly we have some mold so what we cu currently do and it's not very sustainable but until we actually manage to to do some work into the house is we try to to keep that area ventilated we have dehumidifiers and regularly we actually wash those walls with bleach and we paint them at least once a year and that's the only way of of dealing with it we do the it. same as well wash it with bleach and then yeah, I, I Google like old wise tales about how to yes. do with mould and um, yeah, in the winter it's tough because we have to lock one door to yes. open it and yes. yeah, just try and keep But it there's only one solution which is trying to find what, what is the issue and then trying to fix it uh, with proper construction work. And that's, that's costly and that has lots of impacts in your house as well because during a few weeks everything will be covered in dust and you'll yeah, have and labourers you know, coming in and out. Um, but it's something that we, for instance, have to address probably it this is, summer. It is, and my heart is breaking because I, I know there are some, you know, multiple occupancy households yeah. in East London where they don't have that luxury of, let's leave this room ventilated, like someone, exactly. people need to sleep exactly, in there. Exactly. Um, yeah, we, we may not be able to solve everything in this conversation, so perhaps yes. I'll move on. Yes. Um, interested to, yeah, perspective on, on the people that you see coming in and um, particularly your students and, and the other researchers you work with. Um, I know as well you worked for a bit in UCL. I did. So, um, I don't know, any any differences oh, from East to Central? And, yeah. Massively. Um, it's really interesting, UEL, University of East London, has a very interesting social conscience. Uh, we are aware that we represent a lot of BAME students. Uh, we represent students that come from very humble backgrounds. We represent lots of students that are first generation in university. About 60% of our students are, their, are, part of, are, are the first members of their That's family fine. to actually come to university. And when you go to universities like University, uh, College. university College of London, where, where I did my PhD, uh, it was a very different demographic. Uh, far more international students, uh, students that come with uh, well um, larger overseas fees so people that can actually afford to live in London and study in London without having to work um, lots of local students as well that were top in their classes that could have had a pick in whatever university they want and let's face it the, the architectural school in uh, UCL it's top three in the world so 
it's a completely different beast. UEL has far more of a social responsibility and uh, it has a very interesting role in educating students that go through a struggle. Most of them have a, a full-time job to sort of just sustain, and just to go through life. Uh, so they accumulate that with a full-time, uh, most, most of the times, with a full-time degree. Uh, so some of them are come to, to, to school exhausted, uh, they come to school with very little work done on their assignments uh, as, a, as a sort of a homework, so they do what they can while they're here. Um, and they, they, they grovel, they really work really hard to, to get somewhere. Um, but yeah, it's very rewarding because it's a very different type of, of students. And I'm not sure if you know, but I also taught at Cornell for a semester. Cornell is an Ivy League university in the US, uh, only accepts the top 7% of the applications. So again, we're talking about uh, high achievers, <laughs> top of the top of the pop, uh, and um, tuition is seventy thousand dollars a year. And to be an architect, no, to be an architect, you have to go through your undergrad, um, graduate, and then do some years uh, in practice. So it takes seven years. So paying at least five years of seventy thousand, it's it's a lot of money. So it's a very different demographic. And I had students who, which were unbelievably good, overachieving, wouldn't take a B plus as a, as a good grade or a minus. It was all about the A's and the A plus, and they performed, they performed extremely well, but they also got lots of things handed to them in mm. a platter because mm. they could afford to be in those places. Mm. And they probably had top notch education prior to actually joining. So it's a very different scenario from here. Does that kind of thing and culture then affects the design and production of, of designs for buildings? Because I, I'm thinking, for example, and yeah, please tell me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. the lived experience of students of your UCLs and Cornells yes. who may not have yeah, that understanding of, of struggle, etc., yeah. when they're then in a firm or doing designs, yeah. are informed by different set of experiences than Absolutely. others. and. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they, they, they get all the right stuff right about yeah. disability access, but maybe there's other things that they just haven't lived and then, yeah, does that inform them? Does that Absolutely. follow through? Absolutely. That's, that's a very relevant point. So I see some of these students uh, applying for big practices and doing, again, very flashy stuff and uh, high-scale buildings and, and doing very well on that regard. And I see a lot of the UEL students actually going about in a very different route because they have a social and a sort of a community kind of perspective that is very different. And they're very concerned and very interested about what kind of role their building is going to have in their society, in their community. Um, and most of our students, I think they end up in sort of mid-sized, smaller practices and doing things that are far more local, or some of them actually set up on their own uh, way and they have their own practices and they do quite well in sort of smaller residential projects or for more local kind of projects. So it does shape you and also the exposure that you have. It, obviously, if you come from a background where you actually have access to a lot of traveling and Cornell students do a semester in Rome, which is, nice. it's lovely, but not everybody can afford it. And even for Americans to afford a semester in Europe, it's, it's quite a luxury. So they've been exposed to classic architecture. They've been exposed to contemporary architecture. They've, they had a wealth of experience that other students might not have. But these ones have far more of a, almost like a social sustainability kind of mindset that the others don't yeah. have. And how much do you know of um, that kind of links to history? Because I was talking to another person actually who was <laughs> showing me maps of East London and the Blitz meant that East London had to be redesigned um, in ways that the rest of London perhaps wasn't. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think there is that, that culture and, and also the fact that it, this has been a changing place. We were saying on the way here that, mm -hmm. you know, marsh, this place was yes. marshlands not, 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 not long ago. So perhaps there's something else again in, in the water, in the air about that East London spirit mm -hmm. of, yeah, coming from, from war back then, yeah, documents yeah. changing, Canary Wharf right on our doorstep. And so, yeah, maybe there is just more heightened consciousness about our area and 
and how we design buildings yes. in that way. I wish I was more knowledgeable about the whole story of, of East London. And I think I have lots of different fragments of different times in history. I am aware that was a very industrial area. I am aware of, of all the history of the Docklands. Uh, I am aware of the Blitz period. But it's like I can pinpoint bits and pieces. <coughs> Pardon me. And funny enough, I remember being a child or a young teenager back in Portugal. And we did have access to some of the BBC shows. And one of the accesses, one of the shows that I remember glancing at was EastEnders. And I would never guess that it would end up in <laughs> the East End, never in my life. And to give you an idea, I lived for almost 16 years now in London. And I lived everywhere, North London, Northwest <laughs> London, Southwest London, Southeast London, everywhere. I literally lived everywhere. Um, and I never actually equated living in East London. And we were brought here for two reasons, basically. One, because we couldn't afford many places and we wanted a place that had easy access to, to downtown. So East London was one option. And the other, we wanted a place that we saw and we sort of predicted that would have sort of fast development. Uh, so obviously East London had the Olympics in 2012 and had the Olympic Park and had lots of new uh, facilities and equipments that we were aware of. Uh, plus, we also knew that the Crossrail would be a massive add-on. Uh, so when we move in 2015, we obviously account with these two elements, uh, cost and then potential for development. Uh, as architects, we sort of predicted that, well, anyone could, could have predicted that things would ramp up and, and become quite interesting. And that was, that was definitely it. Yeah, and talking about um, the area's future as well, and there's an interesting connector to UCL. So on the Olympic Village yes. site, UCL are building a campus or two, and there's other universities there as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, first of all, both, both your interest in take on that from a design point of view. I, yeah. I don't know if you've seen models of what it's going to look like. I assume maybe yeah, you yeah. have. And yeah, um, I'm s such a layman here, but like, it, you know, is it is it... Is it fine when you have different designs coming in? Is that suppose what's happened to a mm -hmm. to a, to a city, or y you hope you've got some nods to the area and it keeps within that? Yeah, it's extremely positive for Stratford and for East London that we have UCL coming in. We have other universities also coming in. The UCL campus is becoming massive. They have labs. They have uh, the architectural school moved part of their uh, graduate degrees here. Um, it's amazing facilities. From a UCL former student, I have to say it was, there was lots of benefits from being in Bloomsbury, but in terms of facilities, the facilities were terrible. So uh, I could have imagined if I had uh, the opportunity to do my PhD here at, 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 in East, in here East would be far more interesting. In terms of the development and the legacy of the Olympic Park, I have to say I had higher expectations, meaning uh, the Olympic Park, as a, as, a, as a park, is an amazing park. It's really beautiful. The kids love it. There's so many interesting things to do. And we knew that, for instance, the V&A, Victoria and Albert, with the Smithsonian were going to move here, part, part of their facilities. We also knew that Sadler as well, the, the, the ballet company, was also going to open a, a theater here. Um, so many interesting equipments. However, when I look at the urban development and the massing, of, of what is built there. I, as an architect, I sort of question a little bit if it's not over dense in some areas and with very low density in others. I question the height of some of the buildings. And I'm a person that used to work in a, in a, in a practice that did, built lots of skyscrapers and i fascinated about skyscrapers. But I think there's a place in the area to place them. And I think there's some lots of high rises there that are a little bit too massive. Uh, I question the, the transport infrastructure. Um, when there's so many high rises coming in and so much density, uh, what's gonna happen? If you look at the, the, the London Stadium when there is a West Ham game, the hordes of people sort of coming in or coming out and sort of going into the main transport links I'm not sure if it's sized accordingly, and I'm not sure if there's enough alternatives. Okay, there's the overground and there's the tube. There's a, a few buses, but is that enough for the thousands of people that actually are there? 
Uh, and when you look at that main uh, archery in front of Westfield, that sort of um, the creates yeah, and creates the, the link between the park and, St uh, and Stratford Westfield. Mm -hmm. There's so many buildings, they're so close to each other. They're so high in scale and so dense. Um, I don't know if they continue building there. And I, I don't see uh, what, what we call in architecture a main concept or a main sort of directive idea that is driving that. That had the opportunity of being an amazing space, like mm. other Olympic um, games sort of left a, a, an interesting legacy. But I think it's slightly overbuilt and slightly erratic at the mm. moment. And and the issue with the height is that is that sunlight or again it's just the, the visual the height and the the closeness of the buildings I think it creates there like a big canyon of that is completely overshadowed by the buildings and uh, there's there's two issues one is is daylight for these buildings that are being built there and second is overlooking I think there's buildings that are so close that you're going to see your neighbors and what what's the sense of privacy that you have if the next door building it's so close and if you have a window right in front of you yeah. so i question some of the decisions uh that were taken there are you aware of the other stadium that's being discussed the oh, msg no. oh with the the one with the dome yeah. where they're going to do the yeah. projections Madison's, like yeah madison square gardens in london or something like that yeah love the idea again i question have you thought about infrastructure have you th thought about where all these people are going to come from and how they're going to go back if there is a game at the same time if as an event in uh, in this new uh, event place, where are they all going to go to Stratford Station? Is it really sized accordingly? Uh, I question it. If you are, I, I don't use Stratford Station that often. I used to, maybe when I was pregnant, I did use it a lot. And it was quite busy in the morning. Uh, and you get a seat in the overground because it's the first stop, but the second stop, nobody's going to sit. So how do you deal with that? How do you provide parking for all these people? How do you provide access, transport? I think it's a great idea. And I think the more interesting equipments they bring here, better for us, more, more interesting things to do on the weekend. Uh, I do question uh, infrastructure. Yeah, and interesting what you said about, like it, it, it doesn't seem to be an overriding yeah. vision or spirit or yeah. voice kind of guiding it all. Um, interesting. And again, we may not solutionize everything yeah, in yeah. this conversation, so yeah. we'll park that here for now. Um, there was going to be something else I was going to ask. Well, just just to mention on that place as well, it, it's out of your domain perhaps, but um, I'm also not aware of that much social housing within that complex. Mm. I think a lot of it is still private landlords true, true, um, true. and other things, which again is slightly different from what the rest of Stratford um, yeah. needs or the kind of accommodation there. Um, maybe just a word as we close on the mm -hmm. on the old Stratford and and Bow and uh, yeah. you know Leighton area. That, that, that exists in our architecture. Any any thoughts on that? And I don't know. Is, is it at risk yes. or is it is it fun? Well, Bow, for instance, there is an area with beautiful... I'm not sure if they're Edwardian houses. I assume they are. Um, there's an area with really beautiful housing stock. Uh, and that is actually a conservation area. So people have to be very, very careful how they... Uh, I don't know. Um, expand their houses or do any sort of renovation because it is a, right, a conservation area. Area and rightly so, because there's some amazing sort of historical sort of architectural there. And that's great. In Stratford, old Stratford, I think, I think it's a little bit lost a little bit. Um, and personally, I don't see any sort of architectural, um, um, architectural value that, could, that should be sort of retained. Uh, even though there's areas in sort of West Ham, Forest Gate, that has proper Victorian stock. And I think people actually are quite uh, careful in how they restore, how they expand their houses, how they uh, do, for instance, love conversions. And I, I, I think houses are okay to evolve and to sort of accommodate the, the needs of the family. So that's fine. And Leighton, the same. There's there's beautiful areas in Leighton and there's definitely interesting uh, architectural um, elements there. For sure. Awesome. Awesome. Um, last question. Um, What's, what's next for you and your research? And um, yeah, you maybe share with well So we, we have lots of interesting research projects here in the UEL at the moment. Um, so most of my teaching has to do with uh, technical studies and how students build things, uh, what's sort of the, 
the, the buildability of, of the projects they do. So that's pretty much what I do. And in terms of research here, we're doing a lot of research on housing. So we have currently two projects, one in co collaboration with uh, Tonji University in Shanghai, uh, and it's to do a sustainable house that is going to be designed and built in um, Orange County, uh, US. Uh, and hopefully some of the, the lessons we learn on that can sort of be derived to other projects that we have. And the idea is to actually use new technologies and uh, robotic means to actually build this sustainable house. So this is what we currently are working on. And by October, we'll have to actually build this house in California, uh, which is a small house. So it's, it's almost like a test house. And then lessons learned from that are going to sort of be driven to this other second project that we have that is funded by the British Council. And it's to do a sort of sustainable, affordable offsite housing, again, using uh, robotic means. So the university is... Uh, uh, buying a robotic uh, arm, which is controlled by com very basic computer programs and computer software that architects use, such as Rhino and specifically Grasshopper. And uh, hopefully we'll have uh, a number of students that are going to work with us and we're going to sort of program this robot to do interesting things. We don't know exactly what's the technology associated with it, uh, but the idea is to do Housing that is off-site or actually uh, prefab uh, uh, using robotic uh, means, which are fast and affordable and um, could add lots of value to construction and, and to actually try to find new ways of building residential that are efficient, that are affordable, that are sustainable. So that's, that's really where, where we are at. Um, and probably misunderstanding exactly what you said and taking it to the extreme, how far are we from a robot building a house by itself? It's already a possibility. Jeez. There is there there is lots lots of different technologies, and in the US they've tried, for instance, having a three D printer, so a robot that runs on a track, and basically what it does is extrudes concrete layers. It's almost like a a printer. Three D printer. But it does a three D print of a house in concrete, and you might say, oh, okay, but concrete is not very sustainable. Well, the fact is. They're using concrete on compression, meaning we're not using all of the, the three dimensions of, of strength that you can apply on concrete. And on compression, basically, you're just using gravity. And when you're doing that, you're not using rebar. So you're not using steel inside of the concrete. So the concrete is using its own weight to sort of sustain the house. And by not using, by, by avoiding the use of, of steel, it's already on its own far more sustainable than normal reinforced concrete. Yeah. So that's one of the possibilities. Another possibility is uh, what uh, people are using at ETH Zurich, which is one of the top universities as well. So they've programmed robots to actually do uh, complex geometries, so curved walls or walls that have funny angles. And they have a, con a robotic arm, a bit like the, the arm that is used in the automotive industry yeah. and that robot follows the 3d model that is designed in computers and then places uh, bricks in non-conventional locations so if it's a curved wall he knows exactly where to place that that brick and to create that curvature and knows exactly how to put all of the um, all of the the, the gluing uh, elements as well so that those are two options that are currently being done with with robots and obviously they're not mass production they're very niche yet but that's how you start you start with a niche idea it's very expensive at the moment but then as you actually utilize that robot which can be utilized n times it becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and of people course, yeah. start showing an interest of, of, of using that and when you increase the number of people that build these houses you massively lower the cost so. the costs, yeah and i'm thinking of uh, extreme application in like mm -hmm. um again with turkey and syria and hazardous environments yeah. potentially like you know ukraine rebuilding yeah, efforts yeah, yeah. there yeah robot can kind of go on through the night and won't, won't necessarily fear yeah, yeah, um, yeah. anything until the machines become sentient yes and yes, yes have yes. feelings then we're in trouble um another thing on your this product you mentioned uh, collaboration with shanghai yeah um just, just touching on the relationship with China, if I may. Ooh, yes. So, um, I imagine when you're at UCL, um, you know, a large proportion of those international students 
may have been Asian, Chinese, yeah. Chinese, yeah, or Asian. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, the UK again, civil servants there can't be too political, etc. Yes. But there's an interesting relation geopolitical issue with China at the moment. <clears throat> how does that how does it come across with academia? Because academia relies. It on has impacts, yeah. and another another in- interesting impact that you didn't mention, but it, it impacts our work on a daily basis. Is for instance COVID, because COVID for us. You can't say it's over, but you can say that our lives are probably 70, 75% back to normal. There is a different situation. Only recently they've sort of opened up yeah. and sort of removed all the restrictions. So, for instance, for this project, we were supposed to actually do real collaboration on site. Mm. So we were supposed to go there and they were supposed to come here. And that has hindered a little bit the the okay. the dynamic yeah. of the project yeah. so to to give you an idea over we've been working on this over the last six months a year maybe and we've never met personally so we only meet on a weekly basis online um so that is an issue another issue obviously is the fact that universities are funded by the students they uh, uh host and UK universities rely a lot on international students because they pay a premium. Um, and here is a reality too. We have lots of South Asian students, not necessarily Asian, but lots of South Asian students. And they, they pay, uh, their fees are, are larger than most, most well, the local students. So that has an issue with the funding we get as well, obviously. Mm. And, and, and that's, that's uh, an important thing to account. Yeah, yeah. I might leave it there because okay. we've, we've, I've taken a lot of your time and this has been a really interesting conversation. We could keep going on, but one of the things uh, that's, yeah, it's clear is more thought on the solutions, uh, perhaps, but that could be for another time. Okay. Deborah, thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure.